We are very interested in learning and uh, following our curiosity, growing in our understanding of God's Word, but ultimately the, the whole point of all of this is that we would act and look like the disciples Jesus wants us to act like. Um, I put a quote in your outline. I read this this week, and I feel like this is sum summarizing everything we're trying to do. It says, when one responds to Jesus' call to follow him, what then? How is one to live? The Sermon on the Mount provides the answer. So I hope that the next uh, three chapters of the Gospel of Matthew uh, begin to kind of come into to view for you as kind of a roadmap of if I choose to be a disciple of Jesus, this is how I am called to live. Not a heavy burden, not a whole bunch of check boxes, but an absolute blessing, the way that God equips us to live in the way that he intended us to live. So let's pray together and we're going to jump right into chapter four where we begin at verse 18 tonight. God, thank you. Thank you that every time we open your word, something new just jumps out at us. Thank you that even when we've read it many, many times, there's always something fresh, there's always something new. And so we just ask that you would be the freshness in the room. Would you pique our curiosity? Would you uh, just inspire us to ask good questions? And ultimately, would we not just learn in our head, but would our hearts begin to change? We want to know you. And in knowing you, we want to act more and more like people that you've called us to be your disciples in the world. So we love you and we give you this night. Amen. Amen. So you'll recall uh, last week we uh, did the temptation of Jesus. We talked at length that maybe a better word for temptation is actually test. Do you guys remember this? And really what's going on in the story is that Matthew has made some declarations about who Jesus is supposedly is, and then the, the wilderness test is almost exactly that. It's, a, it's, a, it's the final. It's, are you really who you say you are and who the clouds open up at your baptism and say, this is my son? Does he actually pass the test? And we find out that the first interaction that Jesus has with the figure that represents everything evil and dark in the world, Jesus wins. He comes out of the desert, and this is what we get this evening. Chapter 4, verse 18 begins this way. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, being Jesus, saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. Pretty interesting beginning to a story. So we got Jesus walking kind of this obscure place in our minds. This is uh, kind of the north end of the Sea of Galilee. Um, most scholars say that about 80 to 90 percent of everything Jesus does and teaches are going to happen on this little chunk of earth right there in the north end of the, the Sea of Galilee. So let's start there. Let's talk a little bit about Galilee. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you just hear this word Galilee? What do you guys think of? Sea of Galilee. Okay. It's actually a lake, right? Fishing village. When you think village, what do you think, Cecil? Some, some small little homes, thatched roofs, is that kind of what you're thinking of? That's kind of what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of like maybe a fence in the backyard, and maybe if you're lucky, you've got a couple of sheep or goats or something to, to help you along the way. And that's really kind of what Galilee is. It's a very simple, straightforward place in the first century, and it's a, a place that really is, uh, has an economy because of fishing. Exactly that. A couple of things I, I discovered uh, as I was reading late last night are, are Galilee actually has a reputation for being a place, are you ready for this, that likes to harbor uh, zealous people that hate Rome. So these are people like, you, you know, Jesus calls a disciple, his name is Simon the Zealot. Do you guys remember that whole thing? Okay, this is a guy who, uh, the Zealot movement is somebody who absolutely wants to eradicate Rome out of the land. And Galilee is the perfect place for someone to escape to. Because as a small community of families that 
inevitably all know each other because all of their business is centered around this fishing marketplace. They're a tight-knit community, and if you're in with them, a secret can be kept in a place like Galilee. And it turns out that this is a place that really, really values the study and the upbringing of children in the Torah. And this is a place that holds very tightly to it. It's a place that if you go on Google and you just type in, like, what was Galilee like, and you start going page after page, you'll find out that this is a place that liked to um, write letters that were against King Herod, and then they wouldn't sign it. They would just sign, like, from Galilee, like, come catch me if you can. This is a, a place that doesn't like anybody who is not going to follow the Torah to a T. And so I, it's a place that harbors Jewish extremists. So one historian I, I read points out that uh, Galilee has a penchant over time for harboring lots of zealous anti-occupation revolutionaries. So these are people who put hits out on Roman soldiers, who don't want anything to do with Rome, and they want them out of the land. So this is the place that Jesus goes, and this is the place where he meets some teenagers who are fishing on some boats. They've been raised in this kind of a place. So let's talk about them. We get these first four disciples. Now, this is important, and you can write this down. When I think disciples, I immediately think of the number 12. But we have to remember we're going kind of verse by verse and chapter by chapter through the Gospel of Matthew. And if we're just following the story, Jesus does not have 12 disciples yet. He has four. And this is how he gets them. We're going to talk uh, at length about what the disciple-rabbi relationship is, and it turns out that, that Jesus does it a little little differently. So he calls Simon and Andrew, and it tells us that Simon and Andrew are in the boat with their father. Um, so in the Jewish world, boys went off to school, and we're going to talk about Jewish school here in a second because it, it's going to make, a, uh, it's going to make a, an important point. Jewish boys and girls would go off to school. They would learn uh, the Torah. They would begin to memorize the Torah. And they would go at like five or six years old, and they would go for eight or nine years. When they were done with school, the vast majority of them, so over like 90%, were done with school. Completely and entirely, they were done with school. Boys were sent with a dad or with an uncle or a relative to learn a trade or an occupation. Does that make sense to everyone? Very straightforward. And so when we find out that Simon and Andrew are in the boat with their dad, what we know about them is that in the Jewish world, right around 30 years old is when people are thought of as experts in their field, and right around 20 years old is when they began to kind of fly solo in their career. Does that make sense to everyone? So when a, a Jewish male came of age and he was married, you remember this from when we, we studied uh, Mary and Joseph, a male had one year where they were engaged to be married, and his job was to take the one year and begin to fly solo in his career path to separate from his uncle or his dad, whoever was teaching him the trade. Does that make sense? So what we find out about these first two, Simon and Andrew, is that they are not that age yet. They are younger than probably 19 or 20 years old. They are younger than that because they are still in the boat with their dad. They're learning the family business from their dad. Now, uh, this is kind of a, a rabbit trail, but a, an interesting one. Matthew doesn't say this, but Mark makes a little comment about these two guys being in the boat. Do you guys remember what it is? He was in the boat with their father and, do you remember? The hired men. There is this idea that I, I carried with me for the longest time, and it was that fishermen are the poor, lower dregs of the Roman world, which is not true. Some of them were. Fishing was an extremely competitive market to get into. Fish was the cheapest, easiest protein for people to get. And so if you were a good fisherman, you could make a lot of money. You could hire people. And if you were bad, you could go broke, just like in any business. So it turns out that Simon and Andrew are probably part of a fishing family that's probably fairly well off, at least as far as fishermen go. A couple interesting notes. I love that Matthew gives us this foresight. He says, he called Simon, who is called Peter. We haven't heard that story yet, but Matthew's almost given us this glimpse of what's the deal with the name change. And if we haven't read this story yet, one of the things that we're going to take with us is, what's the deal with his name change? I want to read more and figure out what that's all about. Simon uh, in uh, Greek 
is from the same Hebrew word. Simon is Shema. Shamon is Simon. It's the same word in Hebrew as to listen or to hear or literally like to obey. I also think I put a footnote. I, I just thought it was interesting. Simon was the most common Jewish boy name for like three straight centuries, including this one. Andrew uh, comes from a Greek word. And the reason I'm telling you what the names mean is uh, not because these ones are especially significant, but when we did our, our class, we talked about we always want to know what names mean because oftentimes they hold the key to something significant in the story. So Andrew comes from a Greek word, andros, which just means man, but it, it's kind of a synonymous with bravery or courage. So they're in the, the boat with their dad. Jesus goes on a little bit further, and he calls two more. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I get those mixed up? Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, so he calls Simon and Andrew. Uh, they're fishing solo, right? They're by themselves, just the two of them. So just swap everything I just said with the wrong names. Yeah, it's James and John who are in the boat with their dad. Okay, so uh, let's talk about a couple things that we talk about often. What does it mean to be a fisher of men? I think it's kind of a trick, confusing question. Yeah, what were you going to say, Kevin? Like a recruiter. A recruiter. What do you mean? Okay, so you're fishing for young people, and if you catch one, you've recruited them. Right. Okay, there's like some element of that, and we're already thinking towards the end of the story, but I think this is one of the things that makes Matthew such a great writer, is if you're only reading up to this point, you have no idea what that means. So now you're carrying a couple things with you. What's the deal with Simon getting his name changed? I want to know about that. And also, what does it mean to be a fisher of men if you follow him? Now they got out of the boat, and they're going to follow him, so we got to keep reading to figure out what that means. Andrew, yes. Did they already know who Jesus was and uh, how did they trust him just to leave their, their, their good meal for one thing and their trade and then follow somebody that they didn't know? So uh, we're going we're gonna to get there. Oh. I promise. I promise. The, the question, I've been told that I've been terrible at uh, repeating the question for YouTube. The question is why on earth would they just leave everything behind, especially if fishing is not a terrible gig, right? At the very least, you know you'll probably eat, right? Uh, you could probably pawn off your boat if things went south, right? And then so, I'm going to follow somebody I don't know with nothing, right? Because I don't have any credit cards. I don't have uh, any uh, uh, clothes. I don't have any shoes. I'm going with this person that I haven't yeah. even met before. My question is, did they know who he was? Do they know who he was? I personally think, yes, they knew who he was. We're going to talk a little bit about it. But one of the things I was asking the same question was, um, as soon as they get away from the lake, they also don't really have any skills, right? So not only do they leave him behind, once they leave the edge, the perimeter of the lake, now they don't have any like tangible world skills because they clearly are not the educated elite. They've been trained with their father or uh, somebody in the family business. All they do all day is fish. So as soon as Jesus takes them away from the water, they don't have any skills, which is even more terrifying. But we're going to get there. OK, uh, let's talk about fishing. Um, fishing, like I said, is, oh, yeah, Cecil, go ahead. Yeah. Cecil, quit ruining the entire night for everyone, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk at length about that. Yeah, so one of, one of the things is Jesus is definitely a rabbi. We'll just spoil a, a chunk of the night. So one of the things that's never contested in the Bible, so you think, like, what do we know about Jesus? We know about his birth, and then we know all of a sudden he shows up at the Jordan River and he's baptized by John. What on earth happened in between there? Even Luke, who is the only one who tells us anything, tells us basically nothing, just a little sliver of a story, right? One of the things we know absolutely to be true about Jesus is all kinds of people call him this word rabbi, and even the Pharisees who are out to get him never once stop and try to question the fact that he's a rabbi, right? They try to, they try to contend with him on his teaching or maybe some of the company he keeps, but they never say, like, let's see your ID. Did you really graduate from the University of Jerusalem, right? They never do that. Um, 
So there's an assumption that something has happened, and we're going to talk a little bit of, about maybe some of the possibilities. Yeah, we can talk about it now, because we're interested. Um, as, as far as I know, um, a rabbi had to be ordained by a group of other rabbis. Um, and so there was different sects of rabbis. There was clearly like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but there's also kind of like regional groups that might teach or have like um, a leaning on certain theology that maybe another group might not. Um, and so there had to have been some training that you could point to and say, hey, I was the apprentice of a real rabbi. Your own personal rabbi had to advocate for you to be ordained as a rabbi, and then usually they brought in other rabbis who heard your interpretations, your memorization, all those sorts of things. Um, and if you didn't pass the test, then you just didn't pass the test. Uh, one thing that's interesting, though, is uh, sometimes you think rabbi and you think um, like church pastor. Rabbis didn't get paid for being rabbis. Um, this is kind of a, a world where everything revolved around the temple in Jerusalem and the synagogues. Um, so to be a rabbi was very, very prestigious and honorable, but it wasn't like you were just getting paid. You also had a, a career to do, which explains why we, we do know that Jesus knows carpentry. He knows the family trade. Um, so oftentimes boys would study and learn the trade. So. Um, we're going to get there. That's actually the next thing. So let's just skip fishing so we can get back on track. Let's just talk about Jewish schools. How's, how's that? You guys got the idea of fishing. Uh, actually, a couple of things that are important about fishing. Fishing in the first century is not as simple as you just pull up your nets, take the fish, and then you got them. Um, there are marketplaces. Um, you could talk um, to, to David Avina more about like economics and those sorts of things. But there's a whole economy with fish. So if people aren't pulling a lot of fish in, the price for fish goes up. There are certain types of fish that cost more money. And so this is why you have to learn the trade. You can't just go out, be good at fishing, and, and make your way. The other thing that we've uh, found in the last like, couple decades about fishermen in the first century is a lot of them had to speak different languages, at least the fish part of languages, because people would come from all over. Fish was really easy to uh, be salted and preserved. And so it was uh, a protein that was very sought after. So people would come, and you, you didn't want to get shorted money. You wanted to have a good exchange on your goods. And so uh, fishermen are not just dumb people. They're physically hardworking, determined people. But they're also people who know how to navigate the marketplace. How do you get freshwater fish from one place to the other without refrigeration? Uh, so they know how to do all of these sorts of things. So I think um, part of it is we're going to get to points where especially Peter just seems like a total moron. Um, he is in some ways, but we shouldn't let that affect our thought of him as a whole person. He's actually an intelligent, hardworking, well-trained person. So, Okay, let's talk about uh, well-trained and education. Do you guys have a little bullet point that's like growing up in the Jewish world, something like that? Mine's a little different than yours sometimes because I, I forget things, so I just go crazy. Mine's like nine pages long. OK, uh, so here's the Jewish education sy system. There's kind of three basic levels. And in the ancient world, the first level is the only one that girls went to. So um, I'm just going to say that out front. That's just how the world operated. So I'm going to kind of use language that sounds like maybe only boys went to school. Girls actually did go to uh, Beit Sefer, which is the first level of school. Um, so that's the first level of school. Uh, you can think like elementary school. I think literally that word means um, the house of the book. And that's where kids, probably five, six years old, began school and they began to learn the Torah. Now, uh, this blows my mind every time I watch a video or read about it. Because we're talking about five years old to about 11 or 12 years old. This is when these kids are going to school. They're going to school and they're learning all about the Torah. Uh, the first five books of the Bible, they're learning the story, they're learning the characters. But they're not just learning that, they're learning how to memorize it. It is not uncommon in the ancient world for children seven, eight years old to stand in front of a gathering and recite the entire Torah by memory, which is mind-blowing. So when we think elementary school, think elementary school age, but I, I think they're outpacing California public schools at this, this rate. 
So these kids, uh, they are, by the time they're done, they're expected to know um, basically everything there is in there. And, and here's a couple things that often happens. Jesus says stuff like this. Jesus says, um, it, uh, you have heard it said, right? And then he goes on and says something. That was kind of a, a rabbi's indication that in your memory, you should be going through the Rolodex and know where we're at in the Torah. You should know that. Um, a couple of the other things he says is, um, it is written, and then he'll quote a scripture, and we've talked a lot about this. He's not just talking about the one single verse he quoted. He's expecting the audience who all went to this type of school, that they know the entire context, they know the understanding, they know the whole story. So um, sometimes that becomes difficult for us, but it's also why the Bible is so cool, because we can go read the Old Testament for a season, come back to the New Testament, and all of a sudden it makes even more sense than it ever did before. Okay, so these are kids five, six years old, all the way to 12. Yeah? Isn't it likely that they didn't have the book in Yeah. So the question is, did they have a book? And by book, you mean like the Torah? Yeah. Yeah, they definitely did not. Um, if an individual household had a Torah, they would be like the absolute upper echelon elite wealth. Uh, which is actually one of the reasons that in school they start memorizing it because they've been through these times of like Babylon and Assyria where they go in, they get all the Torahs and they light them on fire and they're gone. There's no like computer backup digital copy, right? So kids memorize it. It also becomes hard for us, we learned this in the class a little bit, to think that somehow people passed along the scriptures orally without writing it down for decades or centuries, we immediately think, oh, there's got to be mistakes then. That's how our Western mind works. But when we're talking five, six, seven-year-olds that have memorized the whole thing and a whole community that's memorized the whole thing, they know where the mistakes are and aren't. They know collectively what the story is. So. Okay, the second level of school begins for boys who are kind of seen as like the high achievers. These are like the 4.0 GPA. These are the kids who, hey, these, these kids might have a future more just economically in our Jewish world. They might have a future in teaching us. They might be a, a scribe. They might be some type of lawyer. They might be a rabbi one day. And this is a Beit Midrash, which means um, house of learning. I did not know this until about 5.10, so I don't know an hour and a half ago, they still have this. They have them in like New York City. It's like an entire room with big, huge desks and scrolls that people pull open and they can just go study uh, all this stuff. Um, so this began around you know, 12, 13 years old. And this is only the most elite gifted students. And um, they, would, they would go and they've already learned the Torah. Now they learn a couple other things. They learn the law and the prophets Excuse me, too much of the spin drift. They then began to learn the interpretation skills of not just what does it say, but what does it mean. And in Jewish circles, you can go online and, and look this up on YouTube. It's hilarious to see like these, these you know, chubby rabbi guys in their full robes and their big old beards, and they're just bantering, arguing with each other. They're pointing at each other. They're getting super animated. They're arguing over the interpretation of the scriptures, and they're learning all the laws, and there's like over 600 laws, and kids are now learning what does each law mean? How do you live it out in real life? So not just what does it say, but how does uh, it become interpreted? Um, so they would learn something called the uh, Talmud. The Talmud is kind of a living, breathing document. It's the oral Torah. It's where all the famous best rabbis basically had their commentaries on how you interpret the full scripture. So now these teenage boys, young teenage boys, were beginning to learn everything there was to know about Jewish life. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I don't forget anything here. Are we all good? Okay, the, the third and last um, is not really a school. Uh, they would be called, a student would be called a Talmud. A Talmud would be a disciple. How it would work is however well you did in the second level of schooling determined whether you were going to try to pursue further education. And think of it almost as like the application to college process, but you would do it verbally. Basically, uh, you would be learning in your school, and you'd have teachers and rabbis who would oversee your education. And if you excelled, you would say to them, I would like to continue in my schooling. I'm going to need maybe a letter of recommendation or like an oral encouragement that, yeah, you can do it. 
There would be examinations. Do you know the scriptures? Do you know the interpretations? And if you were found to be good enough, they'd give you the green light. Go ahead. And then you were on your own to go find a rabbi that would accept you to be his disciple. And you would go to a rabbi and you would say, I would like to follow you. And that is code for I will go with you wherever you go. I will listen to everything you say. I will be your disciple in every single way. So um, people are just out on their own. And they have to go find a rabbi who would say yes to them. Now, some rabbis, um, we find out, only are, they only carry a handful of disciples at a time. Some of them have disciples 20, 30, 40 at a time. And sometimes the, the greatest rabbis, it's like, um, it's like an honor thing if you have 100 disciples. That means that so many people wanted to follow you that you're kind of a big deal. It's like how many Instagram followers you have. So this is a teenager a late teenager, probably 18, 19 years old, who signs up with a rabbi. A rabbi says, yes, I've heard everything I need to hear. You clearly know your scriptures. You know your interpretations. I accept you to follow. Come follow me. And they would. And they would go for a decade. Every single thing this rabbi says, you write it down or you commit it to memory. The interpretations, you're learning to interpret like the rabbi. You're learning to finish the rabbi's sentences, and, and we already talked about this, but these are the two most common refrains that a rabbi says. It is written, is the first one, that's a uh, memorization technique. So um, let's see, what would be a good example? If I was a rabbi and I said, uh, it is written, um, love the Lord your God, the disciple would be expected to just pick up where they left off and just keep, keep going until the rabbi says stop. That's enough for me. You've passed that test. The second thing that they would say is, uh, you have heard it said. This is not a memorization. This is an interpretation. So when Jesus says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, so now he's offering his interpretation. And as a disciple, you're expected to think, oh, he's correcting an interpretation he sees as incorrect. He's going to give his interpretation. Does that make sense? So these are the two most common things that all rabbis, not just Jesus, say. Okay, so that is kind of Jewish school in a nutshell. I'm sure it's way deeper than that. I, to, to be honest, that's as much, I think, as I, I pretty much know. So any questions or any insights? Yeah, so the question is, has Jesus gone through the three levels of schooling? The answer is that we don't technically know, but I, I guess I missed a part. So after you're with your rabbi for 10 years or so, your rabbi can decide that you are ready, you are capable of being a rabbi that's ready to call your own disciples. And so they can ordain you from there. So this is the part where history is murky and we're not sure. But a couple things we do know. People call Jesus rabbi. Um, I think I make, made a note of it. Let me pull it up here. So here are uh, the groups of people that call Jesus rabbi in the Bible. Um, his disciples, John's disciples call him this, lawyers and scribes, just ordinary people that we meet, rich, poor, Pharisees and Sadducees. All these people call him this word. Some of them don't even like him. So we know that he is clearly a rabbi. We don't know... Who did he study with? Where did he go to school? We don't know all the details. The only thing that we really know is it seems like maybe John the Baptist has some connection with him. Um, he clearly knows the scriptures really, really, really well. Well enough where last chapter we saw him encounter Satan and he has no problem doing kung fu scripture with him. Yeah, Wanda. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point, Wanda. Wanda is saying that in Luke we find out that little glimpse of sliver of life that Jesus is in the temple. You know, his parents forget about him, or they leave him behind in a caravan, whatever happens. 
and they go back and find him. Not only is he uh, conversing with the rabbis and the, the, the experts there, but they are comfortable with him. So he clearly has some interaction where he knows how to operate, which at least tells me that he is probably in the second level of school, although the Bible doesn't actually ever tell us that. So, um, What's that? He just has divine knowledge. Uh, so it's a divine mystery, isn't it? How do we how do we do the scale of fully human, fully man, right? Um, so I think part of it is you could go in this this circle and try to figure out all these bits and pieces. The end result is going to be the same. It's that Matthew says this guy he's telling you about is the son of God, the long-awaited Messiah who will die for the sins of the world. And I'm going to tell you the story in, in the way Matthew says that you're going to have to determine for yourself whether you believe it or not. Yeah. Well, he can converse comfortably with the zealots who really know the uh, story inside and out and be respected by them. Yeah. So we're not here yet, but one of the things that he does do, Cecil, that's really interesting is he calls 12 disciples, so we got like the 12 tribes thing, but he also calls 12 disciples from very, very, very different backgrounds, um, which is not, as far as I, I know, not super common. So um, I don't know what a good equivalent would be. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but most rabbis are calling... Um, young men that are from like a certain region or have been brought up in like a certain, I don't know, like a prep school matriculates into a certain university, right? And you keep kids who have been formed in kind of the same way of seeing the world. Jesus doesn't really bother to do that. He just starts walking on the seashore and calling out like some fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot, you know, like this is very uncommon. So uh, there's this big giant question, which is, uh, Linda, this is your question. So Jesus calls them, hey, come follow me, but why do they say yes, right? It's a big, it's a big question. I think some of it we're kind of getting at, but I, I, there are three kind of major ways of understanding this. These are like the three big ones. So I'm not going to tell you what to think, but I'll just tell you what kind of the three big ideas that most people will say. The first one I would call it is like the, the spiritual foresight faith explanation, and that is there is something about these disciples, even though that sometimes they don't get it and they, they miss it a little bit, that they have some faith that when they hear Jesus, they recognize that this is the Messiah. Um, and so they follow him because why wouldn't you? So this is kind of like the, they just have faith. These are people who were created before the foundation of the world to be these disciples and they just know. Um, the second explanation is probably a little bit more common if you read like commentaries and things like that. And that's, um, I would call it the John the Baptist kind of connection theory. So John the Baptist out by the Jordan River, we know that he's drawing huge crowds. And even if you're not in the crowd every single day, this is small town village living. So people know who went out there. Who is John? Where did he come from? What did he teach today? They know all of these things, right? Well, enough people are on hand, because we already read the story, that Jesus shows up, and what does John say about him? Come on, it was like three weeks ago. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Exactly. He's like, you guys all came here to be baptized by me. Well, here is one who is so great, I should be baptized by him. Not only that, I'm not even worthy to touch his shoes. And I'm just baptizing you with simple water. He's coming to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit, right? So if John the Baptist is saying these sorts of things, people are now doing this in a small town village. There's a guy that John the Baptist says he's not even worth touching his shoes. And they clearly know who the guy is. Here he comes walking on the seashore and he says, hey, Peter, James, John, come follow me. And they are like, that's the guy that John the Baptist, you know, communicated with. That's the guy. We got to follow him. It's totally worth it, right? It also, uh, this theory would also explain why the dad doesn't have any pushback. The dad probably knows too. Like, well, what were you going to say, Linda? I, I was going to say, I, I was talking to when he was baptized. Yeah. Now, I'm going like, did everybody hear that, or only Jesus heard that? 
what God said, this is my son and that he was well pleased. Yeah. And would that have gone out and people talked about it and maybe then they knew who he really was? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure that I understand if everybody heard God speak at that time. Did everybody hear the question? So when Jesus is baptized, the heavens open, God's voice says, this is my beloved son, in him I'm well pleased. Her question is, did everybody hear that? Or just Jesus? Or... So I'm just curious, how many of you would say, everybody definitely heard that? How many of you would say, like, I'm not totally sure? <laughs> okay. I, I think, as far as Matthew is concerned, the answer is, we don't know. I'm sorry, that's not a good answer, but it's, it's the truth. I, I do know for sure that, how much time we got? Jesus is going to go up on a mountain, and then some crazy stuff is going to happen, and the same voice is going to say it again. And if I'm not, I, I could be wrong. We might have to cross-check me. But I think the disciples are terrified because they hear the sound of thunder. Yeah, Pablo. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's a great point. Yeah. So it's going to happen again. It's definitely going to happen again. So I, I think I'm in the camp that somebody heard it. I don't know if everybody understood it, but clearly John heard it. John knows what's going on here, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this is like the 20th time. I'm just going to say the same thing over and over. Matthew doesn't tell us, right? The, the temptation in the desert story, there's nobody else there. So the only explanation to me is that this is the story, probably the single story in the entire Bible that Jesus has decided, whatever you do, don't forget this story. I want to tell you a story of what happened to me. Um, so that's what Matthew tells us. But a lot of the, the theological roundabout giant questions, the reason that we're still asking them is because the real answer is that we just don't, we just don't know. It, that's just the honest part. I'm sorry, Linda. <laughs> one of these days I'll answer one for you. Okay, the last, the last explanation for why they left the boat is kind of already queued up because we've been talking about being a rabbi, right? So a rabbi walking by the Sea of Galilee, and we know that if a rabbi has disciples, they follow him wherever he goes. So now here comes a rabbi. Now think about the school system and who these fishermen are. They're fishing in a boat. They're not following a rabbi yet. They're not even bothering to try to follow a rabbi because clearly they just didn't do well enough in school or... In some cases, even, even children who did well in school get called home because we just need more hands on, on deck, probably literally for fishermen, right? So all of a sudden, there's a rabbi with no disciples. And in the culture, if you were a young man who was uh, really well-to-do in the Torah and the Law and the Prophets, you would go seek out the rabbi. Now all of a sudden, a rabbi just walks by and says, hey, you, come follow me. He flips the entire script around, and he says, come follow me. Everybody in the Jewish world knows what those words mean. It's an invitation that is unheard of. It doesn't just happen. A rabbi with no disciples, a rabbi who's calling a fisherman into this very honorable position for not just the individuals, but a whole family gets honor for this. The dad probably doesn't even bother to explain it to them. They already know. Just, you just go. You just go figure it out. You just go follow the guy. So the, uh, the rabbi-Talmud uh, relationship theory is exactly that, that these guys grew up in this world and they know that this is the greatest honor. Not only that, if they know who he is, they know that this is like, he's not just a rabbi. He's the rabbi that John the Baptist says is the greatest of all of them. And now he's inviting us. He, maybe he has like eyesight problems and he's not recognizing who we are, but let's just say yes before he figures it out. I don't, I'm not sure. So... That is kind of a, another idea, another theory. I think, I, I said I wouldn't tell you what I thought, but personally I think it's a mix of the last two. That's what I personally think. But Any questions or, or thoughts? Okay, we're going to read one more chunk, 
And then uh, if we need a quick little bathroom break, we're going to go into the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, verse 23 says this. And he went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Uh, There's another little hint that nobody is disputing that Jesus is a rabbi because you don't just get to go stand up front in a synagogue to teach anyone unless it's understood that that's who you are. So he's teaching in their synagogues and he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and he's healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Let's just pause here for a second because this is a new thing that Matthew just introduced to us. Matthew just kind of like slyly just throws in there that, hey, this guy I've been telling you about, he was baptized, he went in the wilderness, he competed with Satan, you know, he called some weird disciples he shouldn't have called by, you know, the cultural, oh, by the way, he just heals people who are sick. Just kind of nonchalantly, yeah, he's a rabbi, he goes into the synagogue, he teaches a little bit, yeah, somebody comes in and is really sick, he just heals them, and he just keeps on writing. This is like a, if you were hearing this, you would say like, whoa, 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 he does what? So let's See it again. He proclaims the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that there's a new kingdom that you can live in, and healing not just like the common cold, he heals every disease and every affliction among the people. Now, if you're hearing this, I would personally, my my feeling like, I'm going to need to hear a story or two of a little bit more detail before I buy that, maybe a little bit if I've never heard this before. Matthew is going to give us the Sermon on the Mount as the teaching, and then Jesus is going to go right into doing what the Sermon on the Mount taught, and he's going to show us what it looks like to to heal all these people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons. Okay, so that's new. So before we were maybe left with the impression, oh, he's healing like physical ailments. Now we're talking about like spiritual evil and oppression is now being lifted off of people. Demons are now gone. People who are having seizures, paralytics, and he healed them. So I think what Matthew's doing is he's adding a little emphasis to like, like, I want you to keep these things in mind. Jesus is doing some very incredible, unheard of things. And his fame has spread all throughout Syria. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis. The Decapolis is just like a generic term for these 10 cities that were kind of like Jerusalem. Like they were allowed to more or less do their own thing as long as they proclaimed that Caesar was the real Lord and they paid their taxes. Um, And from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan... Okay, I have to tell you something that I, I was reading last night, and I thought, like, what? And then I looked at a map, and I thought, you are such an idiot. How did you not know this? The literal country of Jordan is right on the other side of the Jordan. Did you guys all know that? Well, you knew that because you lived there. <laughs> I had no idea. I never, it never even crossed my mind. I looked at a map, and I thought, how could you not know that? <laughs> but there you go. Um, okay, so I think... I think we've just been, kind of the story has been bookended, and now we're going to get the Sermon on the Mount. Now, now here's what I think is going on here. I think Matthew writing this is trying to get us to be scratching our heads and saying, well, wait, 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 wait. I want to hear about this healing stuff. Because it's clear to me that that's why his fame is spreading. The word is getting out. That crazy stuff is happening in Galilee. But now Matthew's going to make you pause for three chapters and hear Jesus teach. So I think it's like a, it's kind of an expert way of writing that you've got to read on. You're curious enough to know more details about that. He hasn't given you any details. So why don't we take a uh, three, four minute bathroom break and then we will come back for the first chunk of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Chapter 5 begins the Sermon on the Mount, which as far as sermons go is kind of the gold standard that nobody's achieved since, but here it is. Um, Chapter 5, verse 1. We'll we'll try to move relatively slowly, but we we got a little over a half an hour, so let's see what we we can do here. So seeing the crowds, so this word is now that Jesus has been out of the wilderness. He's called some disciples, and it seems to me like he's done a significant amount, but Matthew hasn't paused to give us a window into one significant event. 
Crowds are gathering. His fame is spreading very far away. It says, he went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, before we go on, I um, haven't used the whiteboard yet, but the last few weeks, we've been um, talking about how Jesus is kind of reliving the story of Israel. So there's lots of connections with Exodus, and even his birth story uses the same word as Genesis, right? The Genesis of Jesus, the beginning, the origins. Now, Jesus goes up on a mountain, and he's about to proclaim the words of God. Can you think of any other time that somebody went up on a mountain to get God's word? Okay, Moses. Now, there's this Moses-Jesus connection. And I think this is really cool. G, uh, I'm sorry, not Jesus. Moses has some pretty strict instructions about going up on that mountain. Do you guys remember what they are? Take your, okay, shoes got to go. Why? Because it's holy ground. And as a uh, unholy person, you can't just stand on the mountain of God. He's also allowed to only bring one person with him, which is Aaron, right? Brings Aaron. He brings Joshua up at the very end to look into the promised land. So he's allowed to bring Aaron up there. And the explanation is that God is jealous. He's holy. And if you come in contact with that as a sinful person, you will. We have other stories, too. Um, Elijah goes up on a mountain. And Elijah is like this holy, mighty warrior man. And God says, I'm going to let you see my presence. But you can only look at the back. Uh, actually, is he the back, or is he the one that you have to look through the, the, the cloth? One of them's Moses, one of them's Elijah, I can't remember. But the, whole, the point is the same. You can't look at the, the glory of God, or it will strike you dead. There's a story in the Old Testament. There's a whole bunch of well-meaning people who they're following the Ark of the Covenant on the cart. You guys know the story? And it kind of is like clickety-clack-clack, and it starts to tip on the rock. And they're like, oh, no, not the presence of God. And they reach out and grab it, and they die. They touch it, and they're struck dead, right? So this is kind of the idea of the presence of God in the Old Testament. So with that in mind, I want us to keep that in mind when we start talking about Jesus on the mountain, because he's kind of doing something similar. But as God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, this is what it says. It says that he calls people to come with him. So now the holiness of God, that is Jesus, is not going to kill people, it's actually making them well. You guys see that? So like, for instance, there's a law in uh, the Old Testament. If you're a leper, you have to shout out, hey, leper coming, leper coming. Why? Because if you touch somebody, you're going to make them unholy, right? Jesus doesn't even say you're healed. He actually touches the leper first and then pronounces healing. The idea is that this relationship where if you come in contact with God, you die, is now reversed, where now if you come in contact with God, you are pronounced holy, right? It's like a transfer of power in this beautiful way. So Jesus begins to kind of subtly exercise it. It says he goes up on a mountain, he sat down, and his disciples came to him. Now, who are his disciples? Because he doesn't have 12 yet. He's got the four that he called, but I think it's actually a, um, a generic term it's all the people who have been following him, right? They've been following him everywhere he goes. They're just acting like impromptu disciples. And so it's not the four, it's this huge crowd. So he calls everyone who has been willing to follow him out to the mountain. Hey, sit down, I want to tell you a couple things. So he opened his mouth and he taught them. I want to just tell you something. I went on this rabbit trail last night because I was convinced this meant something and I can't find any proof that it does whatsoever. Um, but this whole open his mouth, the first thing I thought was in Genesis, when God opens his mouth, like the fullness of life begins to unfold. And I just thought there's got to be some connection. As far as I know, there's not. But I was convinced there was. <laughs> okay. Yes. So he's up towards Galilee. I think we talked about this last week. So the question is, where is the mountain? And I think the word mountain is, is maybe like an over-exaggeration. It's probably a hill. Um, we're not totally sure, but has somebody been to Israel or the surrounding areas? Because there's a, a handful, I think just one or two places that most people say this is likely where the Sermon on the Mount was. 
Um, I know, Marilyn, you've been there. What is, what is that mountain? Because I, I frankly don't know. Do you know what it's called? Is that you signing up for a homework assignment to tell us next week? It's like an amphitheater -y. Yeah. Oh, the acoustics. So it's just a, a place where people could hear. OK, so her answer is as good as I can give you, because I, I honestly, Mike, I, I don't have any idea. Um, and he says this, blessed are the poor, or blessed, if you've got the King James, right? Who prefers, OK, who's in the blessed camp and who's in the blessed? Who prefers blessed? Who prefers blessed? <laughs> Who doesn't want to publicly state their opinion in front of others? <laughs> 90%. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So a couple of things we have to know about this. Um, there, is, uh, there are nine what we would call beatitudes, although um, we'll get to this in a second if we have time. Most people say there are eight Beatitudes, and then the ninth one is different, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. But the first one and the eighth one are both kind of bookmarked by um, this phrase, for theirs is the kingdom. Um, which is a common, um, common kind of style of teaching in the first century that you use like a big phrase at both ends to let people know that that was the teaching. Does that make sense? Um, so this, this happens on verse 1. Actually, this isn't verses. This is the f first beatitude. I don't know what verse that actually is. And the eighth one. So let's talk about them for a second. So the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. What does that mean? What's the first thing you think of, poor in spirit? Hungry, needy, so you're kind of picking up on this word, right? So poor, you know, economically poor. Hungry, needy. Emotionally, just kind of like sad, or what do you mean, Kevin? Downtrodden. Yeah, okay. The downtrodden. How do you kind of connect these words with, like, the word spirit? Okay, so spirit com communicates with God, so something about that is, is poor or downtrodden. Um, so I just got to tell you right here, right now, we're going to talk about these, but this is the point where I tell you, like, a lot of what I'm going to tell you is things I've read and my understanding. This is not, like, take this to the bank, 100% home run. Um, but, but when I read it and I, I start looking at the words, this is what I, I think it means. It means the, the poor in spirit are those in a world where poor means that you have zero status whatsoever. You are all of these things. You are downtrodden. You are emotionally, economically oppressed. Uh, you have no standing. You have no uh, persuasion in the world. Nobody, frankly, cares about you in any way. In spirit, I almost think like, this would be somebody who comes into church that doesn't know anything about the Bible, doesn't have any connection with God, has no connection whatsoever, and we're in Bible study, and it's like, hey, what do you know? And it becomes like a context of who knows the most, who's closest with God, who's followed God the longest, who's read the most books, and this is the person that has zero on all of them. These are the people in the ancient world, in the kingdom of the world they're living in, matters zero. And Jesus says... For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If that's where you find yourself, you are a phenomenal candidate to enter this new kingdom I'm here to teach you about. So basically, I think I've drawn this really HD 4K picture for you. This is how the Roman world is set up. Here is Caesar. And then we just kind of go down and then down here are all the people that are gathered around Jesus, the sick and the needy. And Jesus says, oh, the new kingdom is just flipped upside down this way. And if you find yourself down here, you are a good candidate to be on in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Um, I, I wrote this quote down um, that I read this week. It says this. Those who truly mourn in the theological sense are those who know the goodness of God and are able to see and grieve the power of evil at work in the world. I would, I would say it this way. Um, let's erase this. Those who mourn. I don't think this is just like somebody is very sad, although that has you know, some bearing. I think this is people who don't numb themselves with Netflix. These are people who don't just hide behind big house, nice car. These are people who recognize there are re real hurting, real pain, real brokenness in the world. They don't just recognize it. They also know that God is good and has a plan that hasn't completely come yet. And so they're mourning for the brokenness of the world. That's, that's their state. They see the world and it, it hurts them to the core. And God said, says, Jesus says, those are blessed. They shall be comforted. And this is the future tense, the shall be. Jesus is saying, if, if you mourn and you recognize that this really is evil and dark in the world and it's hurting people, you will be comforted because you recognize there is a time coming where there will no longer be tears and brokenness. I'm so sorry, April. I can barely hear you. A class system in the Roman world? Yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, it's kind of a confusing. It's not as simple as just like, like chronological class one, two, three, four, five. But, but yeah, there's definitely a class system. And I, I guess this is a good point to say. So we just found out that the crowd following Jesus are people who have been afflicted by all of these diseases. The reason we know that these are people that we're kind of calling lower class is that in the ancient world, if you're very sick, especially if you have a sickness that doesn't get well over time, you are almost always outcast. The reason is, is because when people are living together in communities, they're smart enough to know that if you're sick for a long time, other people will get sick too. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Uh, and because there's not medicine or some of the things that we might have access to now, the best thing to do would be to exile someone until they're better. So if you read through um, like Leviticus, for instance, people will get sick. They'll be told that it's the law for you to leave the camp. You have to go outside. If you think you're better, you have to go present yourself to a rabbi who can check all the signs uh, according to the Torah to see if you are better. If you are, they'll pronounce you clean, and now you can re-enter. So a lot of these people are on the fringes because we just we're told they're afflicted. The other thing in the ancient world is if, like, for instance, you were born with a disability, this is really terrible, but the common thought was that you're being punished for something that happened in your family. And so the reason you're outcast from the beginning is because you're from a dishonorable family. And the reason we know you're dishonorable is because look at how you were born. That is kind of the, the thought. Um, so these are the people that are flocking to Jesus. And Jesus is not saying, just saying, like, hey, welcome. We can find a nice, cozy place to be friends. He's saying, I'm pronouncing a new kingdom where you guys have full citizenship. And I'll prove it to you on earth by healing whatever you have, but I want you to keep your sight set on the kingdom of heaven. So. And also, I think that these people that he was talking to uh, had a, um, a uh, something imprinted in their minds of, of the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees how prompt they were about themselves. Yeah. How they used to stand and say, you know, how great they were. Yeah. And, and Jesus is saying the opposite. Exactly. I, I have, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit as being humble. Oh, it says, blessed are the humble? No, uh, I have in parentheses humble. And I remember asking Gus, and, and I remember Gus so much when I was reading this, is that I said, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? And he said, you have to be humble. Hmm. I mean, that's just the word he said. You know? I think there's something about the word poor that's humble, that there's nothing else. In, if you're truly poor, there's no earthly belongings or things that can comfort you. The only comfort that you can turn to is God, right? Um, I, 
I've actually noticed this in, in Christian circles. You hang around church and you realize a lot of, especially adults who have had a conversion to Christianity, are people who have hit rock bottom. They just feel like I've tried turning to every single creature comfort and none of it comforts me. I have nowhere else to turn. And it's almost like in their humility of I've tried everything, I'll give it to Jesus. It doesn't always happen with people who have, you know, luxuries of life. They can block out some of the difficulties of life with, with other things. Blessed are the meek. I had to look this word up. I'm going to be honest. I haven't heard anyone actually say this word outside of this chapter of the Bible in decades. For they shall inherit the earth. Uh, I think I wrote the dictionary definition. Yeah. Enduring injury or subjugation with patience and without resentment. These are people who are just taking the brunt of the world and they're not holding it against anyone. They're not upset. They're not angry. They're just patiently waiting it out. I think uh, in this world, the meek are people who have just been determined to be just unimportant. You just don't have anything good to say. You have nothing to contribute. You're not necessarily a bad person. You just, we just don't care to hear from you. You shall inherit the earth. I found this interesting, I read this a couple days ago, that um, a lot of scholars um, point to this being quoted straight from a psalm. I, th I think I put it in a footnote. Psalm 37, it says, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. I think that's pretty cool. Um, the last thing I'll say about uh, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. The inheriting uh, of land in the Jewish world is a big deal, you recall? So inheriting land, if it was like, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit four acres. Like Jews would say, like, any land that could be our land that isn't Rome would be awesome. And Jesus says, you will inherit the earth. You will be the new people who inherit it all. It's kind of this, kind of maybe foretaste of when heaven starts to be described an awful lot like the Garden of Eden, back to how God intended, where people... Uh, uh, live in the earth the way that God intended. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Um, let's just talk really quickly. I think we can get to the hunger and thirst, but let's just make sure we're on the same page. What does this guy mean? Never mind. <laughs> Say it again. Walk holy. walk holy. Yeah, I like that. That's a good one. And by walk, you mean kind of like live, like, like your life is holy. What else? What else comes to mind? Without sin. Without sin. Anybody else? Standing. Right standing. Yeah, that's. So I think this actually encompasses. I always do this. I always start writing like that, like I'm incapable of just taking a step. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think these three uh, kind, of in, kind of like encapsulated are it. So I, I think that walking holy and walking without sin is 100% what righteousness is getting at. But every time, especially in the Old Testament, that this word is used, or most of the time, it's used in relationships. So the right standing is you want to live righteously so that you live in the tribe or the camp well. You also want to live righteously so that you're in right standing with God. Does that make sense? So this is uh, the right standing relationally with people and especially with God. The Jewish understanding is if you're not right with God, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to be right with one another. Does that make sense? So uh, constantly the Jews are being told, remember what God has done for you. So when we talk about like the Jubilee year, for instance, why would you just forgive all your debts? Well, because God did that for you. Why would you free the captives? Because you were a captive once and God freed you. Does that make sense? So this idea is kind of wrapped up in the righteousness that you have. Your relationship with God is right. You're pursuing this holy, sinless lifestyle and you come in to right relationships with one another. So this is what it says. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What does it mean to hunger and thirst? Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I'm with you. I, I didn't take that Pablo was saying that you got to live sinlessly. It's that, that it's your pursuit. That when you sin, you're recognizing that this is not how I'm meant to live. I'm pursuing a life that's free of sin, not saying that you could do it or that's what you have to do. Is that what you were saying, Pablo? That's, that's what I had taken, yeah. Uh, oh, that's okay. The desperation. Uh, this is interesting that Jesus teaches this because do you remember a time just like, I don't know, days or weeks before this where Jesus was awfully hungry? Okay, so it's like this absolute like longing, yearning for something tangible. If you're super, super hungry, what you're looking for is food, right? If you're really, really parched and thirsty, you're looking for something to drink. That's something tangible. So I think what Jesus is saying is those who have this deep, deep yearning for something tangible, something that can actually be, and what you're yearning for is righteousness. You are yearning for right standing with God and with one another. He says, you will be satisfied. If you pursue it, if that's what the deepest desire of your heart is, to be in right standing with God and one another, keep listening to the sermon because you can be satisfied. I think that's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I read this this week, that mercy requires a concrete action. It is never just a thought. It requires that you spare or help another person. The idea is somebody has done something that the world has taught you, deserves some kind of retribution or consequence, and you decided in your power position to withhold it, that I show mercy to you, I don't punish you or give you a consequence in the way the world would say is totally acceptable, I hold, withhold that. Jesus says, if that's the type of person that you've become, you too shall receive that kind of mercy. I think at this point in chapter 5, Kevin, I'll get to you in one second. At chapter 5 of Matthew, I don't think people who are hearing this for the first time really have any clue what kind of mercy Jesus is talking about you can receive. But it's, it's coming, and because we know the end of the story, it's kind of amazing that this is what Jesus is saying. If you are somebody who more or less forgives someone else, you are a candidate to receive the ultimate forgiveness of everything. Yeah, Kevin, what were you going to say? You just answered it. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't have to be something huge like you know, the power, but you can be forgiving like another person, like do something that you're transgressed against you, and you just forgive Yeah. Jesus is going to be asked to teach people how to pray, and he prays a chunk about this, doesn't he? It's interesting that the prayer actually is rooted in the Sermon on the Mount. So a lot of the things we're reading finds its way right in the way that Jesus prays. Blessed, actually, you know what, we'll switch it up. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is a really interesting concept. Um... In the ancient world, the heart is understood as the center of everything that motivates who you are. Um, in our world, we might think of this more as like the brain and the heart combined is more of what their understanding was the heart. So the motivation of every action, every thought that you have in the ancient world was thought to come from your heart. So this is what I think is being said. Blessed are those who the motivation of everything they do is pure. And what does it mean for, to be pure? Yeah. Yeah, having clean motives, and I, I think there's um, something kind of built in there. There's a uh, an assumption that how do you get those motives? Can you do it on your own? No. He's talking to people who are desperate that recognize I have no way of getting out of my situation on my own, and so they turn over to Jesus. So there's kind of this assumption that the pure heart thing, you, you can't do that on your own. You can't pursue righteousness on your own. But the fact that you're sitting before Jesus on the mountain, let's remember the context, you are people who already understand that this can come only from God. So when you turn it over to God, I, I love, um, I think it was Karl Barth, the theologian, said that basically every major decision he made, what he tried to do is hold the Bible up and read the decision through the Bible 
it was like his lens of like, how do you, how do you navigate this situation? I'm not sure. I'm not going to use my own motivation, my own desire. I'm going to ask God, God, what is your direction? And I think that's kind of what Jesus is saying in a, a little bit, that every motivation of your heart is directed with God. What do I do now? It's a dependence, a complete dependence on him. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah. This is the did I did I write that, or did you? Just that good? No, no, no. I read it. It's, it's in this book. It is. It is. Yeah, yeah that's right. Because no, you're one hundred percent right. Because uh, this is like a teaching, right? He's preaching a sermon. It's not a dialogue, but he teaches the same thing with a dialogue, and he tells the Pharisees, <clears throat> "You are obsessed with how clean your cups are. Remember that? You polish them." You are like whitewashed tombs. You polish the heck out of your tomb so that it looks beautiful, but guess what's inside? Death and destruction and bones. That's what he's saying. He's saying, let's focus on this thing way before the outside. What's funny is, well, it's not funny, it's just real. The people who are gathered around him are people who maybe have this at least heading in the right direction. The outside appearance is the appearance of people who are nothing. Right? So that's what I think Jesus is getting at. And he says, for they, I'm, I'm sorry, for they shall see God. When your motivation is pure, you begin to see God at work in things that maybe you missed it before. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Linda. Yeah. It's like you're doing not what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, every time I think the hardness of heart, I think of like setting cement that is set and now it can't be changed. It just, it just is what it is. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers. Um, for Jews, this is uh, maybe the most important word in kind of their spiritual life is this word which is usually translated as peace. Um, but shalom is more than just like the absence of conflict. It's, um, so how would I describe this? I can have a relationship, for instance, with a sibling where we don't fight, we don't necessarily like have conflict, but it's not like a phenomenal relationship. Does that make sense? Like you can have relationships with people and it's not like you're at it or you even like dislike each other or have a beef, but it's not like as good as it could be. Does that make sense? So sometimes we translate this as peace and we just think that's the absence of conflict. But I think it's the absence of conflict, but it's like in its fullness. It's like the full, exactly how God intended it to be. So for instance, here's a good example. The city that's built at the capital in Israel is called what? Jerusalem, it has the word shalom right in it. It's supposed to be the place, the foundational place of peace. Why? Because God's presence is there, right? The idea is that the fullness of what God has desired for people is actually happening. So when it says, blessed are the peacemakers, he's saying people who are pursuing this, who are pursuing arbitrating conflict and bringing into a conclusion to people who are not just absent of conflict, but are like having the fullness of peace. They're having the beauty of relationship once again. He says, they shall be called sons of God. In the ancient world, what do sons get? Sons get the inheritance of the father. Isn't that cool? Okay. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah. The peace of God. Yeah. I, I think so. As you're saying, there's nothing wrong with, with that to me at all. I, I don't know 100% that Jesus was trying to be super specific to this equals that. I think he's beginning to, to paint this picture of what is this kingdom of heaven all about? I think what he's trying to say is 
It is open to people who the kingdom of the world has said you don't belong. And he's beginning to paint that picture. So I think 100% what you said makes sense to me. I don't think what Jesus is trying to say is it has to be exactly this word equals that. I think he's kind of painting a, a bigger picture. Yeah. You know, instead of troublemaking. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about having citizenship in this new kingdom that requires that peace is, is part of who you are, right? I think that's what Jesus is getting at, and we're going to land there in a second. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So there's the second bookend. There's the eighth beatitude. Uh, to be persecuted for righteousness, I think, means that you stand for right relationship with God so strongly that the way of the world sees it as a conflict and they react violently towards you. Uh, I think we're seeing this. We see this in the world. You can flip through the news for decades. People who stand very strongly on things that they say, this is exactly what God says. I'm just going to stand on it. There are groups of people who react violently and very angry, right? And they begin to uh, attack. All the while, people are saying, I, you can't attack me because it's not my opinion. I'm just telling you what I've based my whole life on. And people act very angry and violently towards that. So Jesus says, uh, you're blessed. And yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. Okay, so um, this is the ninth beatitude. We don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to do my best to, to flesh it out for you. Blessed are you when others re re revile revile you, huh? Insult. Insult. <laughs> or insult you, that's a good one, and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Uh, this is interesting, that uttering evil and false things, what does that sound like? We talked about this definition of, huh? The liar, the slanderer, Satan, Satan right? This is the description that Jesus gave Satan. When somebody acts as an agent of evil and they speak evil and false things, they basically are slandering you. They are acting as one of the agents of, of evil, one of Satan's agents. He says, uh, when they do all those things on, on my account, rejoice and be glad for your reward in, is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he kind of bookends this teaching, and this is what he basically says. He says, remember the prophets. They weren't part of the mainstream. They were people who got pushed to the margins also. They were people that many times in their moment in time, they were thought of as people that needed to be eliminated. And it was only years later, looking back, that they realized we should have listened to them. They really did have a relationship with God that we should have paid attention to. Now we're sitting in Babylon, right? And he's telling them, when you think of yourselves as lowly and nothing, remember to read yourself into the story that there is a whole group of people called the prophets that had that same situation. And not only were they part of God's plan, they were an enormous part of God's plan. And so he says, rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. Um, now, here's the deal. This is why the ninth beatitude is not always bulked with the first eight. It's that the tense and um, kind of in Greek, the person changes. So it, the first uh, eight are uh, in the second person plural, which is like um, um, all y'all. So I'll give you an example. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I have this backwards. This is what this one shifts to. So all of a sudden, we get a, a, a tense shift from uh, blessed are those. So this is third person plural. Blessed are all of, all, all of those people. And now it is becoming personal. Blessed are you. So I think tangibly, this is what it means. Jesus is speaking in kind of like this large ethereal sense of Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart. Now he turns his attention, and now he's directly talking to these people sitting right in front of him. So he's saying to them, if you listen to this sermon and you start to put it in action, 
Blessed are you, you individual people listening to this, if you hear this and you do it. Blessed are you, but listen, people will insult you, they will persecute you, they will act evil towards you, just so you know that's what's at stake. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the shift in the tense. So that's often why people, um, if you kind of read a commentary, they usually give you the first eight and then the ninth one. Um, so I think the last one is a partial blessing, but it's also a partial warning. If you want to get off this ship, here's a good time because I'm just going to tell you what's coming. There's blessings coming, but sometimes the blessings come after something nasty. So uh, I just want to end with a couple things that are important. Let me just whittle this down. Okay, I think we can do. Um, this is where we can end today because I think this has um, implications for the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. I think there are three basic ways to understand not just the Beatitudes but the entire um, Sermon on the Mount. The first is kind of the ethical, moral, grounds. So Jesus is going to get into your business. He is concerned about how you actually live. This is not for you to go argue in the synagogue with the Pharisees over some interpretations. He's actually concerned about how you live it. So there's a, an element, and he's going to start teaching these sorts of things. He's going to talk about things like your money. He's going to talk about sex. He's going to talk about marriage and divorce. He's going to talk about all these things. And it's not just like some good advice. This is... If you want to have citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, this is how you're supposed to act. And when you act outside of those, the thing that you're supposed to do is acknowledge that you've made a mistake, you've lived outside of God's parameters, and you ask for forgiveness. So the first dimension is kind of the ethical and the moral. Uh, the second, I think, that Jesus is saying is that there is kind of a worldview that has to change. For this first century group of people, they were living in a reality that said they were less than, that they didn't belong, that they had sin in their family history. That's why they were born this way. They were stupid. They were the outcast. They didn't deserve anything. Part of the teaching is to correct a faulty worldview. And the way that Jesus is doing this is pretty direct. He's saying the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Not only do I like you, and not only were you made in God's image, but there's actually an enormous reward for you. You can have it, even though the, uh, the rest of the world is going to say, yeah, that's stupid. Those people know nothing. They're good for nothing. They don't belong. So there's a worldview shift that Jesus is interested in. And then I think the third part is kind of important for us. I think it's um, Jesus is speaking not just to individuals, but you'll notice that he uses this plural language, all you all. All y'all. We, um, we get this word in English. Is it okay if we go two more minutes? Okay. We get this word in English Bible. Jesus says, like, um, blessed are you. And in our culture, we immediately think that's me. But really what this word you is, and this is an English problem, is when I uh, address all of you, I say, hey, how are all of you? It's the same word, right? Jesus is using this as the plural. He's using this word almost entirely as a all of you. Does that make sense? And the reason, I think, is because all of these ethics and standards are not just for us to live like righteous lives where we just do our devotion in the morning with our coffee and put an Instagram photo, although that's incredible. That is intentionally because Jesus is creating a new kind of people, a new community of people that he calls this. And he's going to say that this is what's going to change the world. This is what he calls his bride. He doesn't say you, singular, are going to change the world because you have lots of gifts. He's going to say, you don't have all the gifts, and you don't have all the skills, and you don't have all the abilities, but collectively, if you live in the way that I've taught you, you do. And so this can change the world. All y'all can change the world. So that's the community standard piece of what the Sermon on the Mount is. Okay, it's 637. We should have just held it and not had a bathroom break. Any final thoughts? <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's exactly right. Yeah, the first four are your relationship with God, and then the next four are your relationship with one, uh, one another. Um, the first four Beatitudes, um, so blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, are a description of some relational aspect w- between us and God. The second four, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted, are uh, talking about our relationships with one another. Um, and that's exactly right. We didn't really have time. But that mimics exactly how the Ten Commandments are set up. The first few commandments are set up between your relationship with God, and then the second chunk are all about how you live together. Um, so, awesome. I would love to uh, pray for us. We can keep this conversation going long into the night after I say amen, but let me pray. God, we, um, we're just going to keep plugging away in your word. And I just pray that as we continue, that we would be given the courage and the boldness we need to open up our hearts, even the exposed raw parts. And so we just pray ahead of time that you would would give us the desire to be changed if that's what your desire is for us. So would we not settle for just learning new things, but would we take some of these things to action, would we put them into practice? And I just pray that in your faithfulness, you would um, show us that it really does change who we are, that people really do benefit when we become more like you. So we love you, and we ask that you would just go before us. Amen. Amen. Thanks for sticking it out 10 extra minutes. I apologize. Hopefully, we will be back next Wednesday. Thank you.